they're going to be placed you know, directly on top of the sediment and pinned down. Um, and so they'll act to suppress any infestation there, you know, blocking the light, things like that. Um, hand removal uh, and diver-assisted diver suction harvesting are some other options. I will say that those are more likely to fragment. Some of them have been tried in our region and uh, did not have good results. So I don't recommend actually using those. Um, aqua aquatic vegetation harvesting, again, uh, harvesters cut, they fragment, they don't collect all the fragments, you're spreading it. Uh, dredging, we did try had some pretty good results. Not for every scenario, though. Um, chemical control. I'm not a pesticide applicator. I don't know all of the things that are available for use. I don't think New York State likes Diquat in general. <laughs> um, but broadly, there are contact herbicides where they, they kill upon contact. So they touch the plant, hurt the plant, the whole goal is to prevent any propagules or tubers or seeds um, from being produced. Uh, systemic herbicides, they're applied at very low concentrations. They typically don't affect a, a lot of the other species that are around. There's um, fluoridone in particular is often used in our region for hydrilla because it's, it very much impacts hydrilla and not much else when applied at those low concentrations. Um, and that is applied earlier in the season. You're targeting when that tuber sprouts so that the, the plant takes it in and then it affects the below ground biomass as well, so it affects the tuber. There is no biological control agent approved for use on hydrilla specifically. There's grass carp. I don't have a ton of experience with that. Susan, you probably have a lot more experience with that. <laughs> um, we have tried it. Didn't work great for that scenario. Not that it's not an option. I know the state would not let you know us release these into Cayuga Lake. So it's not really a great option for, for our region. Um, for private isolated pond, if you don't care about all of the other species that are in it, or maybe there aren't any other species in it, then maybe it is an option. Um, so for my examples, here is the Tinker Nature Park Pond. It is a one-acre pond. Um, our former PRISM coordinator actually found it in 2015. This pond is 10 minutes from her house. She went for a walk, said, hey, what's that? <laughs> 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 oh, no. <laughs> um, yeah, these pictures from it, and so we there. They tried uh, a few different uh, management techniques. Um, first, they tried grass carp. Um, they stocked it for and uh, they stocked it for the winter. I don't know how many they had, but I know that there there was permitting uh, associated with it. I think I don't know if there's a, a neighborhood association nearby that is really apprehensive of using herbicides and things like that. So this was a good first step. It's an isolated pond. Um, it's small. Seems like a good place to try out some methods. Uh, the grass carp did not make it over the winter. Don't know if it was you know, shallow, if they froze. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting the nature park directors this summer when I was collecting samples to send for genetics. Um, and they said, actually, there's a heron that really, really likes to hang out. And they think <laughs> that heron had some good dinners uh, that winter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, the next thing they wanted to try was uh, the benthic mats. Um, and so those were installed in 2016, and they're still there. Uh, I think that five-year permit, you know, it, it expired during the pandemic, and um, the DEC is looking into funding to, to now treat this site. Uh, in talking with the, the Nature Center directors, um, you know, they had really good suppression of the hydrilla. 
the contractor who installed the benthic mats did tuber sampling throughout the project, and that tuber bank got depleted, very much so. Um, very, very small amounts of tubers left, if any. Uh, unfortunately, so you, you notice there's a gravel walking path. Um, you think there's a lot of sedimentation or sediment you know, from runoff coming down that hillside. And I guess I don't know what that hill is. Is it this? Um, that is right where that gravel path comes out, and there is hydrilla growing there. It's on top of the mat. <laughs> so um, everywhere else that I could find, the mats are are pretty much fixed in place, and there's no hydrilla, but along that walking path edge uh, where it's mowed, there isn't you know, a buffer there. Um, it looks like there's some sedimentation on top of the mat. Some of the mat has slid down a bit just from you know, the big rain events that we've had. Um, and now hydrilla's growing again. But you know, there's, there's, more, there's more tools in the toolbox. We'll try next. <laughs> <coughs> and for the next one, we're going over to Cayuga Lake. Um, if I use King Ferry or Don's Marina interchangeably, we kind of call them the same thing. King Ferry is the town, but this tiny little private marina was found to have hydrilla. Um, so we received some funding to do hydrilla surveys. And uh, we had a team of two going all the way around Cayuga Lake. Uh, they did a, a point intercept survey from kayaks. They paddled the entire perimeter of Cayuga Lake in three months, in 2018. Uh, they stopped at this marina, asked if they could launch. They're looking for hydrilla, and the owner goes, oh yeah, I got some, you wanna see it? <laughs> no. Uh, so, I'll, I'll talk more on that in a bit if I remember. But um, very small marina. It's you know one dock and a gas pump, but it's private, so it's not you know a a boat launch that's used very often or anything like that. Um, not quite sure how it got introduced there specifically, except it is right where you would put a boat when you launch it. Um, did a lot of survey, only found it inside the marina. 0.03 acre marina, tiny. So this is where they found it. Um, yeah, just pictures, I like pictures. Uh, so, tiny, tiny spot. Uh, we found it in the fall of 2018. Um, we know the lake levels are lowered in the winter, and so we were able to uh, do a request for bids and get per permits from the Army Corps and wherever else we needed to, and we were able to dredge that marina. It was not cheap, and it was a tiny area. <laughs> um, but here I just want to point out, like, they you know, blocked the lake from it. They pumped out the water. As they pumped out the water, they filtered it. They also cleaned everything, you know, before they left the marina. You know, we're trucking all of the dredged material to be disposed in an upland pit that has no hydrological connection, and then it was buried. Um, so we were really just trying to remove the tuber bank from this site. Um, so they, they cleaned all of their equipment before leaving the marina. That runs off, that got filtered, and just in case there are any tubers still there. And those were also removed. <coughs> and then where they were disposing of it, they cleaned everything there as well. So there's very work intensive. And what they told us was, well, we'll do what we can, but per the permit, we can't dredge too close to that dock because we don't want to destabilize it. Okay, that makes sense. Well, that's where it grew back. <laughs> um, so we, we 
So it was dredged in March. We started uh, monitoring it weekly in June, and by the end of June, they found hydrilla right next to the wall. <laughs> They're like, okay, we can't can't dredge this. Um, you know, tried to hand remove whatever plants we saw, but we know there's you know more things that need to follow up with. Uh, We've been working very closely with the Army Corps elsewhere on Cuyahoga Lake, and they were able to coordinate a spot treatment using a contact herbicide for this site. That happened in August of 2019, and we haven't seen any hydrilla since then. Yay. <laughs> um, I, I really do want to push this because we've, we've visited the, it weekly between July the end of August, sometimes into September, every week we check. A lot of Elodea, uh, no hydrilla. And so this is our third field season of no detections. So very, very promising. <laughs> uh, next case study, also pretty promising. Um, still on the east side of Cuga Lake, a little farther to the south. Uh, this was detected August 2019, so shortly after the King Ferry site was uh, chemically treated. Uh, this is a five-acre marina, so much larger. Um, but again, it's, it's mostly enclosed, and we only have ever detected hydrilla inside of the marina. And so working with uh, the, the local hydrilla task force on Cuyahoga Lake uh, and the state and the Army Corps. Um, so these are, these are the hydrilla points. Uh, it is throughout the entire marina and also this little pond that is connected to the marina that's owned by somebody else. Um, but we decided the, the course of treatment was uh, try to do a contact herbicide that fall just to knock back any growth, just in case it's producing turions, try to prevent whatever we can of tuber formation, even though there's probably some there already. Um, so that worked out. It damaged the hydrilla pretty good. Um, so that was a, an October treatment. And then since then, we've used a systemic herbicide only. Um, where it's applied you know, the first week of July through mid or the end of August. Um, we've been treating, so that was 2020, 2021, and treated this year, 2022. We did not find any hydrilla there this year. That was very exciting. <laughs> um, and the colors are a little bit hard to see, but uh, 2019 was purple, so that was you know across the whole marina. 2020, we only found it in the pond. And then last year, there were just a couple spots in the marina and a couple in the pond. And um, yeah, this year we didn't find any. And then I would regret not bringing up the, the one that started it all. <laughs> um, Hydrilla was detected in Ithaca in 2011, and that was before we had a prism. Um, so there is a lot of collaboration with you know, the, the, the local stakeholders uh, communicating with the DEC and the Army Corps, with lots and lots of partners that I've had the pleasure of working with more recently since I've come into my position. Um, so when it was discovered in 2011, they tried DASH, that diver assisted suction harvesting where you're vacuuming fragments and tubers as you hand pull them. Um, didn't really work. <laughs> they tried a uh, contact herbicide just to knock it back. Um, and since then, they've used you know, contact and systemic herbicide in conjunction with each other. Typically, it's a, it's a systemic herbicide to start. And then if they, there's regular monitoring throughout the season, if they find anything that's you know, not being as impacted as it should be, then they'll do a spot treatment just in that spot. And then Aurora is that northernmost point on the lake. Uh, that was detected in 2016. <coughs> I guess what's unique about this one is, uh, well, 
There is a boathouse there, but there's not a boat launch where it was found. Um, the Army Corps of Engineers has been managing that site since 2017. Uh, we, we help with their monitoring efforts however we can. Um, making progress, the, the original infestation area was 30 acres, and in that spot, they've had, I don't know, 90, upper 90s of percent of a uh, population decline according to the tuber bank. At this point, they don't even monitor for tubers because it, it takes too long. Their time could be better spent, doing, better spent doing something else. And so I just, there's a, there's a common theme to all of these, and that's there's not a silver bullet, there's not a golden arrow. It's been a lot of, tri not trial and error, adaptive management, we'll call it. <laughs> um, we try something, evaluate the results, can we improve that? Is something not working? And then you change it and adjust as needed every year. Um, and so this, it isn't just management either, right? Like we're monitoring, we're looking for new populations that are spreading from the current ones. So EDRR is the, <laughs> the survey part is the really important part of managing these. Um, and, you know, if I repeat myself, it's just because I want you to remember. <laughs> uh, rake toss monitoring, you can cover a large area. It's good for broad scales. Um, if there's an area you really want to concentrate on, if something, if you, you know, got a sample and gosh, it looks like it, but you can't really tell, you want to go back to that spot, a visual survey is really, really helpful. Snorkeling, scuba, I highly recommend. Um, and then focusing your survey efforts later in the summer. For our region, that is, you know, mid-August through October even. Uh, later in the season, you know, in September, a lot of the native species are dying back and what's remaining is invasive. So whether it's not one that we're talking about, but starry stonewort is much more prevalent later in the season, so is hydrilla. I think this, you know all this, it's expensive. Find it as early as you can. <laughs> um, because you can have some really good results from it if you find it early. <coughs> Lots of ways to report hydrilla. I know IMAP was mentioned earlier. Um, so I'll say know the location of your suspicious sample. Uh, how big was the area that you found it? Um, take photos if you have know, access to like just a light solid color background if you can float it and water it and spread the leaves out a little bit. It's very helpful. I get a lot of blurry, crumpled up plant pictures. Hey, what's this? <laughs> well, <laughs> something for scale is helpful too. Just stick your hand in there. I don't, I don't care. Something for scale is helpful too. <laughs> um, yes, contact PRISM, contact IMAP. Contact the IS info at DEC. Um, if you do report it to IMAP, it goes in as unconfirmed. Uh, and then there are people like me, probably Ryan, right, um, who are confirmers. We look at all of those records. You can only confirm something if it's there's a picture to confirm it with. <laughs> um, but as soon as those records are submitted, if it's something like Hydrilla, email alerts go everywhere to anybody who needs to know. And so it's a really good way of you know, communicating to everybody that I think I found something. Um, and then if you are managing invasive species, you can track your level of effort, your searched area, because negative results are good too. I want to show that I looked across this other lake and we didn't find it. Um, you can track your, your person hours, points, sampled, things like that. And I think that's all I have. So thank you.
it depends. <laughs> that's like that's my classic ecology answer. <laughs> it depends. It depends on on the area. You know, tinker contain it's it's not connected to anything. It's not really gonna spread from there. Probably I hope, but we're gonna try to suppress it until you know until we decide if is that working. And we've seen this year that it's not working. So we're gonna try something different. Um, I don't know the details of your tiered species, but uh, you know your tier one, tier two species. You know, I think we're gonna try harder to get rid of those because they're not everywhere. We don't want them to be everywhere. <laughs> Did that kind of answer your question? Okay. In Cayuga, we, uh, I think like, no. Trying to think of our like annual field season summaries. Um, eight. Any submerged and floating aquatic plants that are invasive? I think. <laughs> there, there, you know, we see the same 20 species over and over again. Um, some of our, and, and this is specific to my region, some of our invasive plants, aquatic invasive plants, uh, are incredibly widespread and we're just trying to contain them. Like we don't want them to spread somewhere else where they're not everywhere. Um, and that's unfortunately for our region, Eurasian water milfoil, frilly leaf pondweed. Um, I don't really know about brittle naiad. Like I, I see it, I see it a lot. I don't see it super invasive a lot. I uh, don't think it's everywhere. I don't know how much of an impact it's causing, or it's not causing one yet, maybe, but things are changing. <laughs> There's only a, a few species that that are as high priority. Well, nothing's as high priority as hydrilla for our region. <laughs> um, but some of the other ones are, you know, like European frogbed is very much like a, in our region, it's a Lake Ontario embayment um, plant not really in the Finger Lakes, so any new detection of that in a Finger Lake is new and it's important and that's early detection. So it, it kind of depends on like what scale. I'm really jealous. jealous. <laughs> Cayuga Lake has all of them. <laughs> if it were in place for long enough to deplete the tuber bank, um, I've seen a few different numbers for how long tubers are viable, but I've seen seven to ten years. Um, and so that, that initial permit was for five years. And so I'd say if, if we could have, you know, maybe pulled them up, make sure they were in good repair, done tuber sampling to confirm that they're zero or they're declining, and then put them back down for another five years, sure. Yeah. Um, well, and, and with the benthic mats, it, again, it, it's suppression. So. Uh, there was an, I know they were used in Ithaca, like there's a spot that, you know, you didn't, they didn't have the funding to treat that year. It was a more isolated spot, less trafficked spot. Um, so they put the mats on it, like you just stay there until we have the resources to deal with you. <laughs> um, and then elsewhere, uh, so I, I got to visit the Western New York uh, Invasive Species Symposium yesterday, just hang out with the neighbors, I don't know. <laughs> and um, a gentleman from Chautauqua Lake said, you know, we've had starry stonewort. Uh, apparently it's been detected in this lake, but it's never been an issue before, but now it's popping up more. It's getting denser. It's, it's near this boat launch. Like, okay, well, vector is spread, sure, but if you don't want it to spread from there and there, 
isn't really a great way to try to eradicate starry stonewort because it's an algae, and I can give a different presentation on that. Um, you could try a benthic fat. Like you could try to just suppress it so that a boat prop doesn't go through it to spread it. So. Oh, we had uh, a, a Great Lakes Restoration Initiative um, grant from the EPA. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of moving parts. We received that grant to treat Aurora before we knew that the Army Corps was going to be able to uh, manage that site. Um, and so since they were able to take the lead there, they were able to kind of redirect our energy to looking for other new populations. And then since that was a newer, newer, more newly detected than Aurora, um, we were able to divert our funding to deal with that site. Um, it's like $36,000 for 0 0.03 acres. 150 cubic yards of sediment removed. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> uh, there's one in the back and then Aquarium dump. I, uh, the only guess we have is aquarium dump. It is next to that gravel path. Like somebody. <laughs> Silvery Goldie. <laughs> so just, you know, we'll go along, uh, yeah. So I, I guess that, you know if you're trying to focus survey efforts and you have a lot of lakes that don't have a, a public or a private boat launch, just any any point where somebody could interact with the water. So we have a massive spreadsheet of boat launches, marinas, <laughs> where are the gas pumps on the lakes, um, things like that. But I also just have hand launches, restaurants. Like, where is somebody going to go go interact with the lake? Yeah, Jeff. So when it was the contact herbicide first, um, that was, so those populations were found in September or, you know, later in the season, and we were just trying to knock it back. Um, it's, when it's actively growing like that, the systemic herbicide is less effective. Um, the systemic herbicide is way more effective if you can get it at the beginning of the growing season. So if the... In a, in a perfect world, if you found those in June and were able to treat in June, which we wouldn't have been able to because the permitting request for bids is we open for a month for a fair every bit. Yeah, yeah. whatever the funding source needs us to do. <laughs> um, yeah. Wait, we haven't seen it here yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's. Know, if if there are places where we can use the copper-based herbicide or endothal, if, <laughs> if there's a situation where we can use it, those have been really effective. Again, if you like treat it hard the first couple years and you can deplete the tuber bank and, and make some headway, then there's less chance of that resistance developing. I don't. I don't work in the Adirondacks. Yeah, I mean that's an open, open question. I mean yeah. certainly, um, you know. Uh, so I think it's important to step back and think about the whole big picture. You know, so Nate does a good job of going through you know, all these different tools. You know, from um, you know, mechanical to biological to chemical. And so, no one. There's never going to be one silver bullet that solves this problem. But if you look across the United States, I, I think of it as a spectrum. There are some places and some of our parts of the country where coming like every single year all year long and then there's other places that don't do it as heavily but you can do it on that far end in the Adirondacks where historically um, there have been very few um, examples of using herbicides to squat a tree and I think you know I don't know what the term on water now is but there have been some there is a permitting process that has been observed and you're probably aware that you know that was a public agency that was 
great things. Let's give Kate a, a big round of applause. That's almost like a planet question, like a um, because that segues us into um, our our the the last portion. So give me a second while we pull this up, and everybody can uh, stand up right now if you need to. Okay. Yep. 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 We can do that. Okay. So we're right here. All right. We're gonna do our facilitated. Um, we're gonna do our facilitated discussion for. Um, for hydrilla. Okay, so everybody stand up right now. We've got to stretch up. Everybody stand up. We're going to get our icebreaker. So get up, stretch, do a little right now. Okay, so if you feel confident that you could identify hydrilla in a water body, if you saw it, stay standing. If you don't feel confident, sit down. Maybe not sure. Okay, so these, see these people. See these people standing. These are the people you're gonna have to call. You're gonna have to send a sample to if you think you find one in your watershed. So we are all in this together. I know that Kate and myself we get emails and samples and all sorts of different things mailed to us. So you know the first most important thing that we are trying to do here in the Adirondacks. We do not have it in our region. We have to detect it early, okay? So these are our, our, your little group. So look around for the people who can. All right, so you can, everybody can sit back down now. You hand it to your wife. Yeah, Kathy, Kathy will, will know. And it is a difficult one, you know, to, to think about because we do have, you know, the native Elodea species, and they can look, you know, um, pretty similar. And, and it's one of the ones that, you know, you need to – it takes a little bit more time. And, you know, we have this great network of um, – Professionals, uh, agencies, nonprofits, citizens, lake associations out here. And one of the difficulties with, you know, hydrilla is that, oh, well, there's a native one that always looks by it. So you can kind of, you know, go past these areas a lot. And if you're not really paying attention, like, oh, that's just like Elodea and different things. I mean, Kate, when they, um, when they first found the infestation in Cayuga, how many acres was it? Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, when they first reported it, I think it was over 10 acres in size. You know, that, and so like if you're, you know, calling me up and the first call I get from you, you know, hey, I think I found a hydrilla or whatever invasive species, you know, the second question I ask you is, okay, like how much is there of it? If you're telling me right off the bat, you know, 10 acres of something, we got a really long road that we're going to have to go down. And, you know, some of these examples that we have in New York, we're talking millions of dollars of, you know, state local money that's being spent on trying to control them. Um, you know, we just had a very successful um, project in the Croton River down in the lower Hudson. Um, five, six years of working on it, I think $5 million, you know, total funds for one river, you know, to, to remove it from there. And that's not even the reservoir, which was probably like the source of it. So, I mean, we're talking uh, a lot of money. So that's why the prevention, everything that we're doing with our watercraft inspection stewards is, is really important. Okay, um, so because we're really talking about prevention, it's not here in our region. We're going to do a pair share prevention. So um, look around, find a couple people in your groups, and we're going to spend the next, you know, five or ten minutes talking about what are the pathways that you feel would be most likely for introduction to your water body. Um, how confident are you that the current prevention efforts are protect your local water body from hydrilla? And what can you do to improve on these prevention strategies? So think about, you know, the, the policies, the education, or, you know, the, the stewards thing. So there's, there's lots of different stuff. So um, talk amongst yourself, and then we'll regroup in around five to seven minutes um, with that.
Okay, everyone. Um, let's uh, we're do a couple uh, group shares from. So we're talking about prevention. You know, we're trying to keep it out. As we heard all these stories, prevention is, is one of the cases. That old ad is prevention is worth uh, uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So, um, uh, what were some of the discussions that you had in, in, in your groups about the prevention for your local water bodies? How are we feeling? How confident are we feeling? Yeah, or you can talk either, any one of these. Whatever, whatever the dis the high highlights that are coming up in your discussions. Brett. And I think that's a really good key thing to point out, that prevention is not just, you know, a steward at the boat launch. You know, it's that education, it's that awareness, and really at the core of what we're trying to do as, you know, recreationists and, um, you know, boaters out here is, is create that culture where, you know, um, where we are self, you know, enforcing and we're self-policing that, you know, the person you're going out fishing with or you're going out paddling with, that you're saying, hey, did you, like, clean, drain, dry, or you know, did you do that? So you're taking those extra steps. So it's not a, um, you know, it's not an external boat steward that's making you do it. It's, 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 it's yourself. And I think, you know, those are, those are great examples. Um, anybody else have anything that they came up from their groups in the pair share?
Great, all excellent points. And so now um, for our next group discussion is, okay, can we, what do we need to do to be proactive instead of reactive? So we talked about this prevention, but let's say, you know, what are the next steps down that chain with early detection and rapid response and management? So how can we prepare now for hydrilla in the Adirondacks? Are oh, you just saying me? You, yeah. yeah, we do. We do that. So that's Carrie from our early detection rapid response team. So uh, a APIP, we, um, we contract with Adirondack Research to have a specific team that we send out to um, lakes in our across the Adirondack Park that we do a priority ranking that which ones we think are most likely to be um, invaded. So we we do and have for there since uh, 2016. In 2016, we've employed a team that we've been sending out to um, lakes uh, to monitor. So, that, yep, that's one way, APIP and Adirondack Research. So this kind of brings up a good thing. So how many people in our audience are familiar with um, our rapid response plans for our region? We've got a couple. So anybody wants to, not besides Meg, or anybody, like, what, what, you know, have you heard of a rapid response plan? Do you know even what are the agencies that we have rapid response plans from? I've heard the term. That's a good start. Um, yeah, so, you know, essentially what, you know, we're, we're kind of talking about is like, you know, you know, Bill, you mentioned like, hey, like, instead of being reactive, you know, let's be proactive. And so um, we have uh, frameworks in place that we call, you know, rapid response, you know, procedures or things. Um, we're lucky that in our Adirondack region, we have two different agencies that, that have done this. So we have, a, there's a DEC one that you go and then Lake Champlain. So if you're in the part of the park that has the Lake Champlain Basin, maybe Meg, you want to talk a little bit about the Lake Champlain Basin approach?
So I will say in our, you know, in, in the Adirondacks, we are, gr- are very lucky that we have a lot of lake associations. Some of our more forward-thinking lake associations have gone through kind of this pre-planning process. Um, this is something that uh, I'm willing to help your lake association go with. Blake and I were just emailing last week about doing something similar like this for, for Racket Lake. Um, so, um, and not only some lake associations have not only put a plan in place of like who will we, you know, talk to different things, they've already set aside money. So they're saying that, hey, we know this is going to cost something. So, you know, where are we going to come up if we go through, we find something and we got to do a benthic mass, we have to do a hand harvest and we have to do a chemical thing. That's going to, all of a sudden, we're going to have to raise $10,000, $20,000, $30,000. And, you know, in many of these cases, we want to try to do it fairly quickly. So that could be a challenge. So some of the ones that have been a little bit more proactive, they've already set aside some money for, or, you know, a rainy day. Like, okay, if this does happen, we do have some resources that we can tap into. But it's a good thing to start that start that conversation and say, okay, if this did happen, um, what would it go through? And that brings us to our last question. So what are the resources, the information, tools, funding that you would need to have in place to help manage a hydrilla infestation if it came to your water body? So what's the easy one? Right off the bat, everybody's going to need – they're going to need money. <laughs> okay, so we, need, we should start to think about – you know, what are the ways that we can either collectively, you know, are there collective pools of money that, that we can have? Are there different agencies or different things that could, um, nonprofit organizations that could be a source of, of funding um, that we have? Are there things that your own lake association or community can do to have that rainy day fund established? What are some other resources that you think that you, you would need for your community? Blue Mountain Lake, right out the door.
Yeah, that's a great point. We're very lucky here in the Adirondacks that, a, like Meg said, we're not only connected, but we have this great prism network where we're learning from each other. And so uh, sometimes the distance in the Adirondacks makes is a, is a downfall, but sometimes it's a benefit. So, you know, we haven't been, we have a longer time frame to, you know, plan for this. We, we actually, you know, we've been talking about this really in, in, in error since uh, 2014, APIP, you know, helped did a kind of workshop where we were talking about hydrilla and this thing. And so, you know, I'm proud to say that because of a lot of efforts, a lot of people in this room, you know, eight years later, we still don't have it. So hopefully 20, 30, eight, another eight years, we still don't have it. But, you know, and we're... Great. Well, I think that's a great segue to, for us to end and say that this is uh, the end of today. And Tamara has a couple housekeeping things I think she wants to say. And then um, and then we'll say, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely be in contact in, in different ways through, throughout, the, throughout the year. Right. So I'll let Tamara so, finish uh, up. Please